Well, welcome everybody. We're glad that you're here and we hope that we give you exciting information that will avoid that after lunch slump that we all feel sometimes. Uh, today we are going to talk about executive function and we're going to especially talk about how executive function learning differences affect our students' learning and often how it affects our students' writing. We're also going to define executive function because that can be a little hard to get our arms around. Uh, we're going to talk about how this issue of executive function differences affects both the academic achievement and the behavior of so many of our students. We're going to talk about why those challenges occur, and most important, we're going to talk about what we as educators can do to help. Okay, <coughs> this issue of executive function, as I said, is hard to wrap our minds around. Cheryl and I do a full day workshop on executive function, but to boil it down to the most ground level definition, executive function is essentially how the brain takes in information, organizes it and remembers it, and then does something with it. There isn't any blood test for executive function. Kids with executive function often get labels like these. Executive function, here it is an official definition of executive function. I'm not going to read it, you can read it yourselves. The red line things here are some of the things that executive function controls in our learning. <coughs> Again, I'm not going to read those. There are a lot of them. Let's go down to the down and dirty, things that we might see in the classroom. How we might be detectives to determine whether one of our students has executive function learning differences or not. I want to preface this by saying we do have to be a detective. We have to look at behaviors and we have to avoid that trap of assigning learning differences as behaviors. Yes, they are behaviors, but the response to that is not consequences. The response is always set the student up for success. Be proactive instead of reactive. All right, these are some behaviors that you might see at the elementary level that would give you a clue that one of your students has an executive function learning difference. You know, I'm not saying disability. I'm saying a learning difference. In the classroom, the student with executive function learning difference might have trouble making plans. Even as simple as, what do I do first, get my pencil out? That might be something that doesn't immediately occur to a child with executive function challenges. Keep track of time. Keep track of more than one thing at a time. I have to spell correctly and do the rest of these tasks. I could go through all of these, but can you picture some of your students in your classroom who might respond with some of the blue? If you do, it may be because of a challenge on, in one of the black. High school, look at the same thing. These are some of the behaviors we might see in a high school setting that would indicate a student has executive function differences. Trouble finishing a packet. One of those longer assignments that a teacher gives for a whole unit's work. It's a very common thing at the high school. Understanding how much time it takes for a project to be completed. If any of you are parents, this is a battle with some of our, some of our children, some of our own children. Oh, this uh, multi-step project is due tomorrow. Oh, well. No problem, I'll start it right after my favorite TV show. And speaking of favorite TV show, I don't have it on here, but the idea of needing noise in the background, needing the TV on the background to do your work, the ability to multitask, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't, it may be the cause of difficulty with filtering, i.e. an executive function difference. I like this slide because uh, it's from Dr. Thomas Brown's executive functioning model. Uh, thinking about the executive functioning area of the brain as being the conductor of the orchestra. And so that that conductor is making sure that everything happens in sync, where the violins come in and the cellos play and so on, and it's a beautiful melody and music happens. And so if you think about that, then you look at the pieces of the executive functioning areas, that activation of organizing and prioritizing, of being able to focus and to attend, to be able to control my emotional and emotional regulation areas, memory, effort, sustaining effort, 
how many of you know a challenging student has trouble sustaining effort? It's tough to stay on task. It's tough to keep going. It's a long day at school. So that conductor of the orchestra is a voice uh, in tune with the other instruments. So we have to think how we can help support our kids. And just a minute, we're just going to talk about some of the major areas of executive functioning. And when you think about processing speed, Think again about whether it's visual or auditorily, I have to take in this information. I have to have time to manipulate, organize, do something with it, and then respond, either on a piece of paper, verbally, through my actions. And we know many of our students with executive processing or executive functioning difficulties have problems with processing speed. Our world is moving way too fast, way too fast for many of us, and it's tough if I'm back here just thinking receptively about what you even just asked me to do, and you expect me to have had a paragraph written down. So we're going to specifically kind of keep pushing us back to writing since that's what our focus is, but it impacts everything. And when we think about trying to finish homework, taking notes, being able to finish a test, that's all processing speed in addition to other areas. When I look at attention and focus, it's not just att paying attention, what they like to say, it's truly focusing getting rid of all that information that I don't need to be paying attention to in the background, filtering that out. And that's hard to do for many of our students. It's also even what I like to call the social fit. Maintaining my attention and focus on something I am not interested in personally in your conversation and or what you're instructing me in right now. But many of our kids with good executive function skills, they can do that. They're able to process and be okay with attention and focus. Also just want to say that staying on topic, so going back to the writing, if I have trouble with attention and focus, how many of you have kids that they start off with, you know, I love going to the Grand Canyon for vacation, all of a sudden it's talking about the dinosaurs that they were playing with the other day. It's, it's really hard to keep my attention and focus on what I'm writing about. So again, another problem. Emotional regulation. It's one thing to have emotions, it's another to respond upon them. And so when we think about, I said this morning, we use our stop, our SOTA acronym in our building, a stop, observe, deliberate, and then act. This is tough for many of our kids. If they go from zero to 10, and they are not emotionally regulated due to executive functioning challenges. And so we need, again, to look at challenges or at strategies to help support. And how I'm then dealing with those frustrations when they come up socially, emotionally, in the classroom academically, every time I pick up a pencil, it's a challenge. Every time I'm in front of the keyboard, this is a great tool, but I still can't organize it my other executive function challenges to get it on paper. A lot of our students with executive function challenges have difficulty with that frustration and uh, regulating their emotions, and they tend to give up real easily. They'll write one sentence and then they'll be exhausted, mentally or physically exhausted that's often related to executive function learning differences. Cheryl mentioned working memory. Working memory is essentially our short-term memory. In a young adult, typical, for most of us in this room, even though we're probably not young adults, would be about seven digits, that's like a phone number, six for letters and five for words. It's less for kids and it's less for kids with executive function challenges. That kind of just gives you uh, a baseline. All right, how does this challenge with working memory affect writing? Well, look at this. The, the ability to remember a thought, a sentence, or an idea that you want to write and hold on to it while you're writing. Our students with executive function working memory dif difficulties can't do that. It's very difficult. Number two, being able to remember what you've read and how it applies to what's then being read. Remember page one and mentally reference that on page three being able to keep one piece of information in your mind while working with another all of these are things that we expect our students to do many of our typically developing students can do it many of our students without ieps without any special ed eligibility struggle with this we need to be detectives and set them up for success all right Let's look at specifically the writing process. Why is it so difficult for so many of our students with executive function differences? Well, let's look at some of the skills that are required for writing. We've got a lot of them. We've got language, we've got imitation, we've got organization, we've got motor <coughs> we've got proprioceptive input, 
uh, sensory regulation, uh, my visual, my eyes and hands working together, and again, my attention and focus, being aware of where my body is in space, being able to self-regulate. Again, all the executive functioning areas we talked about. The list is endless. And then let's take a look at the list of what is needed for writing and a challenge for our kids with executive function problems. Language, imitation, organization, problem solving, sensory regulation, and so on. They're all there. So when a teacher says, I know they can do a better job, they can get this, I've seen how neat they write the spelling words, very rote, very memorized if they can. So different from the many, many deep layers that are going on during the writing process. All right, writing is not just a concern for our kids with special ed eligibility. It's not just a concern and a difficulty for our kids that we know have executive function challenges. Uh, NADP puts out uh, a survey every three years, and then they report it like every seven years. It's hard to get current reports of what they've done. But anyway, the most recent one I could find in print was from 2011, and at that time they said only 24% of 8th graders and 24% of 12th graders performed at a proficient level in writing achievement. That kind of takes your breath away. We're not talking about kids in special ed settings. We're not talking about kids with identified eligibilities. We're talking about all kids. That's really kind of frightening. And then similarly, the Mayo Clinic did a long series of studies that looked at the issue of written language disorder. And they found, they reported in 2009, that one in six kids in the general population had qualified as having a written language disorder. Think of that. Think about our classrooms and our schools. Now, what are we going to do? We are not going to put every one in six kids under eligibility for special ed services in the school, we would all go crazy. And it would be a disservice for our students. But the important <coughs> part here is to realize that this percentage of our kids are struggling with the writing process. It's important to recognize that as being a factor in their academic achievement. Uh, I want to look up, there been, when that Mayo Clinic thing came out, there was a big uproar. And so they looked at specific populations of uh, exceptional learners at special ed eligibilities to see if there was a link. And they found out that there certainly was. This particular one, they looked at the link between writing and kids with <coughs> learning disabilities. It's kind of a no-brainer that there's going to be a difficulty noted. But what they didn't expect was that the difficulty with written language in kids with learning disabilities actually got worse. It got worse as they got older. The discrepancy got bigger. And they figured out the reason it got bigger was because as kids got older, there was a greater demand for independent work. Right? We provide a lot of support, supports for young kids as they're developing their writing skills. And then we fade those away without teaching students to use those strategies independently. Then they reach the point where they have to do independent work and they didn't know what to do. That was pretty telling. They looked at the link between writing and speech language. Think of all the kids that just see the speech language pathologist in your school and are identified as having a language disorder but really don't receive any other kinds of supports. Okay, they took, did a longitudinal study to see how those kids fared in written language. And that they, they found that by age 19, 61% of the kids who have been identified as having that speech or language delay, 61% of the boys and 55% of the girls had a written language disorder, qualified as having a written language disorder. When they did the population that was not identified as having speech and language disorder, it was 18 and 9. Look at the difference. It doesn't go away. Most kids get discharged from the speech pathologist when they're in what, seventh grade or something like that? That doesn't mean that the needs that drove that eligibility for language delay have gone away. They need to be supported in different ways or a continuation of the supports that were in place when they were younger. Similar results when they looked at uh, ADHD and written language disorder, the numbers are about the same. It was just kind of astonishing at the link between the disability and written language <coughs> disorder. We also found, of course, um, as we were looking for a lot of research for our book, 
a lot of the studies related to why we know our kids on the spectrum are challenged with writing. The layers are just, every facet of it is difficult. And what the studies again show that the quality of letter formation, the quantity of what they were writing, the depth and the content of what they were writing um, was all impacted and all recently all due to the executive functioning areas. So it's nothing new that we don't know, but we want to lay a foundation to when you go back to say, you know, I know they can work harder and many of our kids have a lot more potential. We've got to be making sure that we are setting them up for success and giving them strategies and setting up the environment in order to get out of the great things they that we know that they know. And so many times we will hear, uh, the student could tell me volumes. He's got a story inside of him, and he would give me a whole book, but I put a piece of paper in front of him, and I get two sentences. So if you need to share this kind of information, I know some of it gets a little cumbersome on the research type of things, but it really gives credibility to why we need more time on the strategies that we know we need to integrate. And this is just a little short tour of the brain, just to get your brain thinking about it yourself. Again, I'm thinking about that whole area of the prefrontal cortex area and looking at those frontal lobes and they are the hub for executive functioning. This is the area where we're taking in and organizing language and an organization of thought and attention and focus. And if you have trouble in these areas, you're gonna have trouble in writing. When you look at executive functioning, you look at that cerebral cortex and it's that higher cortical thinking, that gray matter of the brain. It's really, really important. Uh, the price of decision making, planning, and raising, all of these things are vital to everything that we do. Again, executive functioning. Look at that cerebellum area and then the posterior region of the brain, and that's that area that is in charge of our motor planning, our balance, our posture, coordination. It has a big link um, with long term memory retrieval. It has a lot of neurons between the cerebral cortex, that higher thinking area, <coughs> and the cerebellum. So that's really, really, really important for all of our learning and, and uh, substantiates what we want to do with our students. Okay, this slide has way too much writing on it, but this is actually one of my favorite slides, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it. This is the amygdala. The, the amygdala has been in the news a lot lately. Now that, now that we're talking about it, you're going to home, go home, and I swear you're going to hear it in the news in the next week, amygdala. The amygdala is a part of the brain that's in the limbic system. It's called our threat detector. It's what controls a student's fight, flight, fright responses. The amygdala, when it's in a, set, a period of stress, when it feels stress, it kind of sends up filters and keeps neural signals from going to our planning and organization areas of our brain. Now, stress blocks that learning. Look at these stressors that a lot of students feel in the classroom. Think about that as a stress-inducing thing for a lot of your students. When a student is perceiving stress, like in one of those areas, their learning shuts down. <coughs> it's just kind of amazing. There have been a lot of studies related to that. There's this down here. This is fun. They did a study, University of Illinois did a study called Cooties and Crushes. I'm not lying, I couldn't make that up. And they looked at gender and how gender made a difference in kids' learning. And they were looking specifically at the activation in the amygdala, the stress area. And they found that kids who were between ages four and seven reacted their amygdala, put up a stress signal as if there are cooties present. So if a girl is put in a group with a boy, the amygdala had a cootie response. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. That's between ages four and seven. Between ages seven and when puberty onset, it didn't show much. So mixed gender groups seemed to work pretty smoothly. When puberty set in from then on until probably infinity, <laughs> crushes kicked in, and that raised the activation in the amygdala and shut down learning. Isn't that amazing? Goodies and flat crushes. Okay, that's part of what the amygdala does. The amygdala has also been in the news on a different issue this week. On February 16th, new brain research came out where they found that the amygdala and the hippocampus and three other areas of the brain were actually smaller in volume in kids with ADHD. They were looking specifically at that population. 
the medical science, the neuroscience world is really excited about that because that's one of the first things that they've found that has maybe been a window of opportunity for us be, to be able to target treatments for a specific area of the brain. So that's brand new information. <coughs> Watch out for that. But the amygdala is an exciting area. Just want to add, yeah. uh, just so there was a visual that I had learned from another instructor. Uh, just it's a deep nuclei of the temporal lobe. So it's like above your ear lobes. Uh, just that's where the amygdala are located. So if you want to try to remember that. If you want to look up more information to share on Edutopia, if you're not familiar with that website, tap into it. It's got awesome articles and things, and they talk a lot about stress in our students and blocking learning and memory due to the amygdala. But also over here, remember, the amygdala likes movement, deep breathing, dopamine release with joy, laughter, and being read to. So that's going to help it all. Okay. okay, excellent. All right, I want to move on to another part of the brain, the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe has been in the news a lot lately too, but it does many things. But one of the things that it contains are the mirror neurons, what we call the monkey see, monkey do neurons, that help a student <coughs> or a child learn to imitate what somebody else does, like how to make your letters, where to put your hands on a keyboard. In individuals with various forms of executive function differences, this often doesn't work. Well, it works, you get why. But it doesn't work as efficiently as it does in the students who are neurotypically developing. So some of your students with learning disabilities, with autism, with ADHD, with some of these other differences will require more practice. It's not lack of compliance, it's not lack of effort. Their brain is just wired differently. Okay, let's look at the prefrontal cortex. That's this right here. It's sort of the CEO of executive function. These are pictures of brain maturation, of especially of this part of the brain. The, the front prefrontal cortex doesn't fully mature until around age 19, and later for boys. So what does that control? It controls judgment, prioritizing, and delayed gratification. Okay, there are just some differences there. So why teach writing? Well, because the research will support that it makes a difference in everything a child does academically. Writing about material has been read increases comprehension, fluency, and word reading through re teaching writing. We've had a big push in our district that writing is an emphasis this year. Uh, the boys we're doing it, but it's even more of an emphasis with our coach and coaching staff coming in and helping support teachers as well. Increasing the amount of student writing increases reading comprehension which is a huge big deal to make those connections. And so looking at the strategies as we're doing writing and technology pieces with writing embedded in with reading comprehension. We can all help our students be better writers, being those students with executive functioning differences. And we can change the executive functioning within the brain. We can make changes in it, not just accommodations. And that's exciting to hear. Kathy's going to tell us a little bit here in a bit. But before we start, I want you to think about as we looked at our, writing our book, we were trying to look at things that were simple for teachers to understand. That this wasn't rocket science. We did not have to put everything we knew in a book. We wanted it simple. We wanted it easy. We wanted to go to uh, a resource, something to hand out to a parent or a teacher. With that in mind, we started to look at what is the most important <coughs> lenses that we could do from. And those four lenses we believed were sensory, motor, language, and organization. And if you have all four of those lenses, as we go along and talk about strategies, then you'll be thinking about the whole child in regards to the writing process and a lot of other things in their academic and social life as well. But those, these four make a huge difference. So I'm really saying, does that child, for instance, understand what the task even was? Do they have the expressive language to get out what they want to say on a piece of paper? So many times we hear our kids, they write the way they talk. So think about it. By expecting a child to write in full sentences, and they're not even speaking in full sentences, I might want to relook at my goal. Trying to break things down in the organizational into tinier chunks to make it more manageable for our students. Sensory, huge area, distractions, filtering out noises, sounds, self-regulation of movement, of being able just to attend and to focus, being able to what that pencil feels like in my hand at this foreign object that I hate to use. Trying to look at the motor skills themselves, my eyes and my hands do not coordinate and work well together. 
I'm going to be really challenged with printing and writing skills and even keyboarding for many of our students. Okay, many, many of our students with executive function differences are going to have difficulty with language processing and organization. The next seven or eight slides are going to be specific strategies that you might try with one of your students. If you have a student that falls into this category, that doesn't seem to be following the directions, that seems to not be able to break assignments, <coughs> in, feel free to take pictures of these if you, if, if you want to. These are things that are good for a lot of our students. When you are working with a student with, with either a language delay and or an executive function difference, remember the big <coughs> three. Use less words. Talk less. Use visual supports. A lot of our kids get so bogged down in the overload of language that they miss the direction entirely. Give visual examples whenever possible. This is not a crutch. This is a life skill. How many of us are going to take pictures of things that we want to remember? Sharon takes a picture of where she parks her car in the parking lot, no picture. But, but we all need visual supports. They help us all. They help our students too. It's not a crutch, it's a life <coughs> skill. Break big assignments into smaller chunks. I have some examples of how you can do that. Okay, let's say you have a young student who is just learning to organize words into sentences. Anybody have any students who don't, who leave, who don't leave any spaces between their words when they write? Okay, it's a common, common problem. There are a lot of reasons for it, but one of the reasons for it is that a lot of students with executive function differences don't perceive words as separate units. They hear a sentence as one long word. And this is a skill you may have to teach. I would not use this strategy for middle school or high school. I would only use it at elementary. But the way you could do this is have the student dictate a sentence the adult actually writes the sentence and then cut it up into words and mix it up on the table. Let the student glue it into order <coughs> on a piece of paper and then copy the sentence. So the student's making up the sentence, the student is organizing the words into sentence, and the student's writing the sentence. You're doing all of your academic tasks, but you're breaking it down into manageable chunks. It will help the student at many, many levels. Okay, for an older student, for an older student who has to do, say, a research paper, break that research into two chunks, into content and organization. Don't assume that the student can do both. This is good for all students. Back in my day, we used index cards. Anybody remember what index cards are? All right, well, you can use a computer now, but, but there was some value in having these tangible pieces where we wrote one piece of information on each card and then, after we had a whole fistful of cards, then we put them down on the table and organized them. That's a really solid teaching strategy for kids. It breaks the task down into content and then organization. You can do it similarly on a computer. Oops, you want to the Okay, you can do it similarly on a computer. You can have a student dictate a sentence, the adult types it. The student dictates some, another piece of information, the adult types it. After the student has told you everything he knows, then move those sentences around, have the students move them around into a paragraph. Again, you're breaking down content and organization into two distinct parts. It will really help your students. This one I showed yesterday, another uh, really good strategy for elementary students who have trouble sequencing ideas. Do a simple timeline. Now this one I did in advance. All those pretty pictures come from Google Images. You can uh, go to Google Images and type in any word and you get a picture like that, cut and paste it onto a Word document, draw a straight line, put a number under each one of those pictures, and then ask the student to tell you about, in this case, their trip to the Apple Orchard. Verbally rehearse it first before you ask a student to write. That's called priming. That's a research-based process priming. You're priming the student with the information that they're going to write. You're doing it before they actually write it. This is a really good strategy. I just add, this is also sequential thinking and processing. It's also evidence-based practice for the use of visuals. Remember, our words just disappear. I've got something very tangible to go back to. 
So we've even taken pictures of our kids at the apple orchard, so all the kids were involved in the pictures, and then were able to do a shared writing task if that was appropriate for that classroom. And this has so many components on it, it's so well worth the time, regardless of any student, I can't encourage you enough to use them. I use it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a high school student, you can do the same strategy with keywords. And this one you can do on the fly. You don't have to prepare this in advance. Sit down with the student, draw a straight line on the top of his paper, and have the student tell you what he knows. This particular one is write a report about Martin Luther King. Many of our students know a lot of information, but when they tell us, you know, it's a little bit here, a little bit there, it's not organized, it's a... So, your student may say, oh, Martin Luther King, uh, he died in Memphis. You, the teacher, write Memphis down at that end of the line. What else do you know about Martin Luther King? Uh, he was born in Atlanta. You, the teacher, write Atlanta down here. What else do you know? Well, he said that I have a dream speech. You, the teacher, write dream someplace in the middle of the line. Have the student tell you verbally everything he knows about that topic. After he's told you everything he knows, then you go through and put numbers up under all of the keywords. Then have the student verbally rehearse it and tell you his information as you point to the numbers. After he's told it to you, <coughs> that's the priming, then have him write it. What you've done is you have taught him how to sequence his thoughts here. This is a portable strategy. This is one that if it works for a student, don't just use it for that assignment. Use it a lot because you want him to learn that this is a life skill that he can take into college, he can take into the workplace to help him organize his thoughts. It's a really good strategy. Okay, here's another one. I told a story yesterday about a student that I had had who couldn't make choices. Brilliant young woman couldn't make choices. She was so smart. She had flights of ideas and couldn't decide what to write about. This was her breakthrough strategy. What we learned to do with her is put, in her case, four options that she could write about. In real life, she was doing it on science, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this one right now as an example. Say the assignment was to write about your favorite president. You, the adult, choose about four options. Then Cheryl, will you be my student? Sure. Okay, Cheryl, who's that? <coughs> Washington, who's that? Lincoln. Who's that? Reagan. Who's that? Obama. Which one do you think is most interesting? Oh. Uh, I was going to say something I will say. Uh, Washington. <laughs> Washington. Okay. I, the teacher, am going to do the writing on this paper. Washington was the first first president of the United States. Is that just why I chose Washington? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. All right. And who are you writing again about? Uh, Washington. Washington. I write it down. We don't want the student to use up all of their enthusiasm on writing this part. Washington was president from, okay, sure, uh, uh, obviously this would be something you would do when the student had some information at their fingertips. Go through this kind of support and then write at least three paragraphs about this president on a separate sheet of paper. And use these sentences for your first paragraph. Look what we have here. Not only have we broken out of inertia and helped the student make their, their choices, we have also helped that student build their introductory paragraph. Introductory paragraphs are weighed heavily on our Indiana um, academic standards and our, on our end of course assessments and on our state standards. They're kind of hard to teach sometimes, but this is a wonderful way to teach it with our students, with all of our students. It's a universal design strategy. It helps them learn to make choices and get started on their writing tasks. This one is my favorite. I think I said that before in my goal, but this one's my very favorite. So feel free to use this one. This strategy was designed by TEACH. It was designed to use with students on the autism spectrum. And we have found in subsequent years that it's good for all students. All students will do a better job if they know exactly what they have to do, exactly how much they have to do, and exactly what they do when they're finished. I've done this in a few different ways. Uh, a lot of teachers now write that on their chalkboard, which is great, or their whiteboard, that's great. But our students with executive function challenges have a hard time tracking from there to there, from there to there. So it doesn't always work for our students with executive function things like ADHD and learning disabilities and autism. 
I have found the most effective thing to do is to go into a classroom. I put this on a half a sheet of paper. I go in with a blank. When one of my students, or a student is struggling with writing, I fill out one of these for that particular student using as few words as possible. What do you have to do? Write a paragraph about lettering. How much do I have to do? Six sentences. Make it as concrete as possible. If the teacher's working on a specific thing, put some clues in there on what they're supposed to do. But otherwise, use as few words as possible. What do I do when I'm finished? Always, always tell them what to do with their paper. Whether they give it to the teacher, whether they put it in their backpack, think of all the papers that end up stuffed in the back of the box or the back of the locker or back of the desk, something like that. And then tell them what they can do for a reinforcement. Then you can do a of it. Always choose something for the reinforcement that is not hard to stop when it's time to move on to the next academic task. Just a little bit about graphic organizers more. Think about the graphic organizer being this visual picture of being able to analyze and make sense of everything I'm trying to write about. But that it is actually trying with brain to find and interpret information as a pattern that receives that information as meaningful input for memory storage. Many of our children, the way their brains are wired, a graphic organizer can be a really valuable tool for them to have a system of storing that information. And then it's visually there, again, it's their working memory. It's keeping them on track. It's organizing all those thoughts. Every time we want them to be able to stay on topic, include all these details. Any kind of graphic organizer, if you can find one that works for your student, and I'm sure as a teacher, um, and I know I have ones I like, use what you like, but ask your students which one they would prefer. Have some choice of <coughs> You can upload them. There's a, a um, free app called GotHub that can convert your PDF. Any worksheet, any graphic organizer, a text box will open and the child can type because I have many students who are creating graphic organizers that they cannot read. <laughs> they are not the right size. I can enlarge the piece of paper, but it's still what they're writing inside is very hard for them to read. And the goal of that graphic organizer is I have this visual model, this sequential thought that's helping me to be a better writer. So I want to really provide the tools that they need. Do you have a question? Yeah. It's called Doc, D O C H U B, Doc Hub. Okay. If you are doing something that is a worksheet where I'm thinking about it, on a or a worksheet and you have an iPad. There is another app that is called Snap Type, and you can take a picture of your worksheet, or you can take a picture of your graphic organizer. And anywhere then when you touch on your screen, the text box is going to open and the student can type. <coughs> this is gold to me as an OT and trying to look at how we're going to do worksheets and get work out for our students. So snap type, it's free. There's a, a little more expensive model that's I think two dollars that you can save the files. But the free one's pretty darn nice. And all you have to do once you take that picture, I can email it to myself or I can email it to a teacher, and then they can print it to me a copy of uh, So really cool. Uh, but please keep in mind the importance. I never even forget the first year I was in schools and I went to a middle school and I asked the teachers, do you use a graphic organizer? And she asked me what that meant. And I was just so very surprised. We all have different skill levels. But it's invaluable if you're sitting down and write, right? And I think the earlier we teach our kids what the graphic organizer can be and what the simple can be, the better they can know. And then we may need to number the pieces in that graphic organizer so they remember the sequence of what's involved. And some of the graphic organizers do that so nicely in and of themselves. So, yeah. I've had a hard time. Uh, selling my secondary teachers on the value of graphic <laughs> organizers because teachers picture something like this, you know, something that's just for a little child. This is really good, but you certainly would not use this for high school students. It would be socially appropriate or knowledge-based appropriate. There are graphic organizers, I'm going to show you several of them, that are appropriate for a variety of ages. This is one right here. You've probably seen this one. This is to build an opinion piece. Oh, I'm going to go back for a minute. TeachersPayTeachers.com. They have lots and lots and lots of freebies. <coughs> lots of freebies. Also, you can just go on Google Images, and there are probably 500 free graphic organizers that you can print off there. It's just amazing. Uh, here's one for an opinion piece. If you find a graphic organizer or a type of visual support that works through with your student, I can't emphasize enough. 
Don't just use it once. You are not trying to help that student get a good grade just on that assignment. You are trying to find a strategy, a support that, will, that your student can learn to use independently. I know I said that before, I'll probably say it again. You don't want your student velcroed to you at the hip. You don't want them to only be able to organize their writing if you're sitting next to them. Find a support, share with your team members what's working for that student. Share with next year's teacher what works for that student so everybody can help that student learn to use strategies independently. This is a good one for secondary kids. I'm sorry, the print is a little bit uh, vague there, but this is one of the ones that I pulled off of Google Images. Okay, this is specifically for, um, it's a persuasion map. One of our Indiana writing standards, and we have a boatload of Indiana writing standards. One of them is to write a persuasive writing piece. This is a great way to teach that. And it's socially appropriate for the older kids. If you pull it off of Google Images yourself, the print will be darker. This is how I can get it. This is another one for problem, problem and solution. Oh, this is yours. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. All right. Go for it. Same, <laughs> same sort of thing. Always make sure that so, the graphic organizer <laughs> you're using is appropriate for the age. Would this, does this look visually like something you'd want to use for a ninth grade kid? No, of course not. So be very, very sensitive to this. This is a good one. But this is that Lucid Art. Yes, this, that's, this is an app. And it's a free app called Lucid Art. And it's a nice one. There's a lot out there. But this one happens to be a nice one. At the same time, we, there's a video clip. Uh, we won't show right at the moment. But go online and you can watch it. It's very easy to view. Um, it gives you nice tools. It's a nice visual mapping guide for, for writing. A lot of our schools have a software product called Inspiration or Kidspiration. Has anybody ever used Inspiration or Kidspiration? It came out, I don't know, 15 years ago, something like that, maybe even longer. And a lot of our computers in the schools have it on there, but it's been on there for so long that people forget it's there. But it offers many, many graphic organizers electronically. So you may have it in your school and not even know it. Maybe on the computer on your desk and you don't even know. But take a look for Kidspiration or Inspiration. It has a lot of this at your fingertips. The next seven or eight slides are how you can help your students with executive function challenges break down a big assignment. All right, many of our kids get packet assignments. Get a packet for either a book report or a science report or a, a research paper or something like that. And the assignment with that packet is the packet is due in three weeks, right? How successful are our kids with executive function challenges with those packet three week things? They're not successful. They often work really, really hard on the first one or two pages, and then the packet either gets lost or it gets stuck in the back of the backpack or the locker, <coughs> and it just doesn't get done. If you have a student with executive function differences, break that task apart and put a separate due date on each piece. I've got here, I'm going to go through this really fast. This is doing a book report. Typical example. Okay, break the task down, one task per day. This would be the typical title page. See at the bottom it says, give it to my teacher on blank. Put the date on that one. Next page, main characters. Obviously, don't use the pictures if you're doing high school and middle school. But anyway, very little writing on there on the teacher's part. Give this to my teacher on blank day. Next page, setting. Same sort of thing. Next page, plot. Next page, the end. Okay, whatever your teacher would choose. We did this with one of my students who was on the autism spectrum. It was a fourth or fifth grade, I forget which grade she was in at that time. She couldn't, wouldn't write. They were doing book reports. All the kids got the packet. I happened to be her autism consultant at the time, so I did this. She was the first one I did this on and did exactly what I just said. One task per day, one due date. Her report was the best in the class. The next time they did book reports, the teacher did this for the whole class. Okay, again, it's a life skill. It's teaching kids how to break a task down into individual segments and have a sense of completion for each individual segment. All right, this is a study that came out a few years ago, and I cannot figure out why it didn't make a bigger splash, because this was pretty amazing. The WIRC, the Writing Intensive Reading Comprehension, it was from 2005. You can still get stuff on the internet about it, but it didn't make a big splash. But what their research showed 
was that literacy, <laughs> both reading and writing, improved when you did them at the same time. So they created these things called think sheets, where the kids would read on this side and answer the questions right here, rather than reading the whole chapter and then going back and answering the questions, looking up the answers to them, everything. These think sheets were done that. And everything, every form of literacy, just blossom like crazy. The think sheets are still available online. So you could put in that WIRC writing intensive reading comprehension, even though it was back in 2005, and look at think sheets and see if there's anything that you could use in your classrooms. It was a successful, successful strategy. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about, as we were trying to do this executive functioning workshop idea of how we would organize our thoughts and how we wanted to present, and looking at how you can now present sensory strategies for kids who with executive functioning challenges that are trying to support their academics and specifically the writing. So as you look at sensory regulation, if you weren't in one of our earlier ones, I really want to think about everything I take in from my environment, and I have internal senses as well. And all this information comes into my brain and nervous system, and I have to make sense of it, have it integrate, and then I make an adaptive response. And if I'm not well sensory regulated, it's going to be hard to make that adaptive response of pick up that pencil, get busy with my writing task, get my work done. So I'm going to look at from a standpoint of looking from the auditory and visual, where my body is in space, my sense of movement and balance and touch. All of these things are impacted from sensory processing areas. So when you think about just simple things you can do for your whole class, think about things like once instruction has happened, who needs to go to a quiet area to work? When I need to concentrate, when I need the book the report, the report, an evaluation report done, I need to go to my quiet spot. I'm not being punished, I just know I'm going to get my work done there. So for students to understand that I may need a steady care, I may need to go to the back of the room to a small table with my back away from distractions. I need to be able to have my headphones on while I'm trying to concentrate and think more clearly. Perhaps some students have music piped in to their Chromebook or their computers, something that's calming and organizing that no one else can care with them, if they're able to handle that. I may have visual cues up in that study carol where they know what's first, next, and then. Their graphic organizer is set up, their Chromebook or their computer, their pencil paper, whatever it is. I've got everything else removed, distractions are gone, and the student has learned to do this themselves with time. So I'm really going to look at that environmental part and set them up for success. One kiddo may say, you know what, I do great in a beanbag chair. I just need to be wedged in the back corner, the deep pressure around my body, and I'm calm and I feel pretty darn good. Another student's going to tell you, I need to go to my standing desk. I need to stand. I'm tired of sitting. I listen the whole time you're instructing. I want to go to a standing desk. So we want to look at those positioning options and say, everybody is not the same. You know, we look at universal design first, but if I set up my classroom with flexible seating options for my kids, then everybody's got choices, not just my one student who needs some extra supports. And so think about whether you have low tables that you can sit on the floor, Standing areas, we took bed risers to just use as standing desks, very cheap and inexpensive. My young students, we took and just raised desks to their highest level, and they were tall enough to stand at. Um, several of my kids have standing desks, and they also have seating areas, because I don't feel like standing all day long. Some of our kids have ball areas where they can sit and bounce and move. I think it's very hard to work on reading when you are bouncing, so you need to look at what that station is used for. Maybe it's just during instructional time that I can just self-regulate and take in every piece of information that teacher needs me to get, and then I go over to my more stable area when I start to do actual writing and or reading. So you have to just kind of let it be fluid and let kids have choices. When you first bring things out at first, is it sometimes like a roller coaster ride? Absolutely. Anything new is novel and change takes time, usually four to six weeks. Uh, I was saying earlier that we had one whole classroom that we did balls on, and it was a first grade classroom, and I won't do it again. It was a learning lesson for me. I was all excited that the teacher wanted to do it. And I had almost started to back up. I wanted to do the labor when we thought it through. Let's do stations. Let's have different options. And the kids will have an opportunity to be on the balls, but it's a station. And then we'll grow that. And I have a third grade class that's just about all balls, and they were able to handle it much better. Um, so there's lots of ways to do it. It's very doable. If you have a therapist you're working with, that's what they're there for. I encourage them to say, I just need some ideas. Come and give me some thought. I look online and there's a ton of things about flexible seating and so forth. 
Um, again, regulating your alertness. How does your engine run? Is anybody familiar with that program? A new one that is out of zones of regulation. And it's looking, zones of regulation will work more on even all inclusive of social, emotional, and social regulation. Um, how does your engine run? It looks a little bit more specifically on sensory regulation. Both really great programs of looking at where we are. You know, my engine's flying down the road at top speed, I'm gonna have an accident, I'm gonna get a speeding ticket, I'm gonna be in trouble. My engine is out of gas, I got a flat tire, I am running really low right now. And I need some, some gas in my, in my engine and a tuna. So where am I at? I'm teaching kids throughout the day, what do I need at certain times of day in order to be successful? Um, sensory regulation and focus and attention. Having the entire class doing exercise and movement breaks, we've talked about that if you were at one of our earlier ones, but most of you were not. Vitally important, and I've got some slides, the research is tremendous on the benefits of aerobic exercise and getting your heart at <laughs> target heart rate. And where does it work on in the brain? Prefrontal cortex, executive functioning. That is where the research is supported. It is changing lots of things that I'll show you here in just a minute. These are just examples of doing Hindo squats, entire classes running in place, having a whole class, um, rub hands on thighs, you know, wake up activities, open and close my hands, squeeze my hands together, chair push-ups. I'll teach kids that when you aren't bothering one student in class, that if you sit your hands on the side of your chair and raise your bottom and your legs off your chair and do a seat push-up. It is hard if you are a taller person um, and or have a little extra in the behind area. Uh, that I can get through it part way, but my kids are great at it. But think about what they're doing, what they can do independently. It's not going to bother anybody else. And when they did those chair push-ups, they strengthened and woke up proprioception-wise, sensory-wise, all their upper body. So they did a strengthening exercise to prepare them before they start riding and also calm their nervous system. We're going to stand for just one minute and do some Hindu squats. We like to show a video usually of exercise, but for the sake of time today. So, Everybody, please stand. We're going to stand. Quick movement break. You guys are sitting. Did any of you guys do um, Paula's one, two, three activity? Did anybody do the spring break one, two, three? Okay. Just, just one, just a couple. Do you guys mind repeating it? It's, it's an awesome activity. No, it's not. So you don't have to see it. I'm just asking you to do it. It is. Okay, we're going to do it really fast. I'm going to say one. Now he's going to say. Hurry up, we don't have much time. Two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, you get that idea? After you do that just a few rounds, I'm going to say freeze, and then I'm going to say two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. You get the idea? Then we're going to break one more time, and I'm going to say woo, three, woo, three. I will post that, I will tweet that later with a picture of you guys. Now, if there's somebody in here who absolutely does not want their face shown on Twitter, just come up to me afterwards and I won't picture that. <laughs> Why that's wonderful is we had a great one. Our brain just got rid of a moment of having to concentrate on anything at all. We've had a long day, a long break, two days. You release all that, it gave your brain a break. But what I also love about it is you increase dopamine in your system. And when you increase dopamine, you help the amygdala de-stress and let learning happen in <coughs> So it's a win-win. I encourage you, it's so easy to do, and it's so fun. Um, there's a million of them out there that you can do. Um, I'll give some other examples here in a bit. So when you think about aerobic exercise, I want you to get this in your brain really strong. It's really, really, really important. This is like medication. It is the strongest thing we have to prevent medication. The things that happen you can do to get your heart rate up, that's the key. When teachers tell me we move around, we change stations, we do collaborative learning, that's awesome. That's not aerobic exercise. You can jog in place, you can do jumping jacks, you can sit down, stand up. You can have all the students jog in place to answer response to questions. And they stop jogging when the answer is yes or no, or a good thing or a bad thing uh, health-wise. We did it with you know healthy foods. Jog in place if you think this is healthy. Stop jogging if it's not healthy. There's so many ways to integrate it into your academic. Getting physical activity every 15 minutes, I know that sounds like a lot, but allowing movement, allowing a brain break, allowing whatever it is that it takes for your class. I had a teacher who said she likes it, everything is so calm, she teaches very calm, and that's wonderful, and she keeps a calm room. 
the kids are not getting their heart rate up and not doing enough extra aerobic exercises. Okay. Um, with autism, it was an evidence-based practice. It is an evidence-based practice for autism that exercise was found to, and I'm talking again, getting heart rate up and movement, exercise was found to decrease negative behaviors and increase positive behaviors. And so this was 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon. They had scooter boards and mini tramps and stretching and weights and all the good things that therapists talk about trying to do. And this again were studies with children on the spectrum. Uh, they were lots of movement and exercise, walking 20 minutes. And then every hour they would do like a brain break. They could do yoga, you could do deep breathing, something that was done once per hour in addition to 20 morning, 20 afternoon. I tell you the class that I have, a class of kids that are on the spectrum, that are diploma bound, they get supports in an area and then are in inclusion classes as much as possible. These kids, 20 minutes, this teacher I love her to pieces. She, she loves her kids and she, she leads with her heart. And um, she was so emotionally involved with all of them and so excited about this that she took it to the 10th degree. She does 20 minutes every morning. And those kids come back and I promise you, I say I'm gonna videotape them if I can get an okay. They come back and they have their Chromebooks. They sit in front of the teacher. They are there for that lesson and they work for 30 minutes. And these are kids with um, notable challenges with sensory regulation. The exercise component has made a huge difference. They were doing sensory breaks before, making a difference, but they weren't doing it for the length and intensity. So we really increased the big difference. I love this. I have this uh, video, or this video, this picture that is supposed to buy my coffee machine so my teachers can see it and look and see it every time they go to make coffees. This shows that the uh, one side of the brain on rest or brain at rest, no exercise. This is a brain after walking. And this was a composite of about, I believe, 20 students or so of sixth grade students who did not have an identified special challenge, um, but they were just students at rest prior to taking a test. And then they went and they walked for 20 minutes. They did not run, they did not speed it, they just walked. And this is their brain on exercise and what a difference there's going on in the top. So that's exciting. Um, exercise in each ADHD, they found that it really helps to decrease a lot of the kids don't need as much medication if they are doing the right kind of exercise. And always keep in mind, again, we can get exercise and we can say, this kiddo was out of recess, but he came back in and he was erratic and he's all hyped up and he's overloaded and he didn't seem any better. Well, he was out there running, but it was erratic and it wasn't structured. And even though he needed the movement, I wanted his heart rate up, that was great. Now I've got to bring him back and get some big muscle, heavy work activity into his system, some calming and some organizing piece. So don't give up the movement. We just have to have that extra ingredient to make it just right. So he might be the kiddo I said that comes back and he's carrying the basket balls from recess. He has a heavy job he's doing, something that he's doing his 5% of his body weight to get those muscles working. Um, but there's an increase in dopamine, norepinephrine, by spurring the growth of new receptors in certain areas of the brain. Um, I love that they're talking about attention and focus, and each time they focus their attention, they're activating their brain's alerting and pathways for learning. And what happens is every time you exercise, those attention and attending areas, are the pathways are getting deeper and deeper. So we're changing brain chemistry not only by moving and by exercising and trying to work on attention and focus. And so if a child is able to do sustained attention activities of something they enjoy doing, then that is going to make those pathways even deeper and better. All right, many of our students with executive function learning differences have a hard time regulating their emotions. Nod your head if you have seen this with your students. Um, they don't have the same internal ability to judge whether things are big problems or small problems. For example, breaking a pencil when they write may be as big a deal as a major in injury from another student. Uh, so one of the reasons that happens is because they don't have skills to problem solve, recognize their fingers, their feelings, and self-regulate. What can we do about that as teachers? Well, one of the things we can do, as Cheryl was just talking about, is provide movement activities often during the school day. <coughs> often during the school day. Trying to get that heart rate elevated. Remember how that stimulates the vestibular system? And that improves attention, focus, and language processing. That's a win-win situation. 
also helps defuse the threat detector of the amygdala. It's a win-win situation. Provide a safe place to work. If you have a student who has a hard time regulating his emotions, give him an alternate place where part of the time he can do his work. That does not mean set his desk over in the corner so he can look at the wall. No, no, no. But maybe have a place either against the wall or in the media center or someplace or in the back of the room that's quiet, that has less stimulation, where he can do some of his work. The bottom thing over here in this picture <coughs> is the incredible five-point scale. Has anybody used the incredible five-point scale? It is a wonderful tool for teaching students to self-regulate, to recognize what their body is telling them, and move toward a calmer place. Uh, Essentially, a number one is, I'm doing great and I'm ready to work. And a number five is, I'm about to explode, I'm out of control. And you help the student recognize what their body is telling them for a two, a three, and a four. So they begin to regulate themselves and recognize when they're at a three and I need to do some of my self-calming strategies so I can get down and be ready to work again. It's a wonderful strategy. I encourage you to look that up. The book is a teeny tiny book. It's an easy, easy strategy. And it's the best one I have found for teaching students to self-regulate their emotions. Uh, remember what we were talking about, the amygdala, that it's the threat detector. Cheryl's going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. We are almost out of time. We've been asked to allow time at the end for questions. So we're going to talk just a little bit more. Be thinking about questions you want to ask. And we'll try to cover a few more slides. And then we'll get the pictures. To, to questions. They look like I'm caught here. Oh, I knew this would happen. What I want to point out on this, they said that the study showed that when students experience trust and positive feelings towards a teacher, and support their classrooms, there was an increase in their long-term memory and their higher order cognitive thinking. And I want you really to think mm -hmm. about that. The research is supporting more and more. And again, we keep talking about stress and amygdala and all this, because the research is so tremendous on, if you want a good writer and you want a good learner, we've got to have an emotional relationship with our students. Um, and I also think we are too busy trying to figure out, as professionals, because we know everything, we think, what the problem is and why it's occurring and to have conversations with your child and with your students and to have time to problem solve together and even for kids that are limited in language it's amazing when you use visuals what they can tell you the other important thing is i don't know if you've ever heard of the 10-2 strategy that that toughest kid that's really having those challenges with writing for example whatever the need is that for 10 days for two minutes you're going to block time to have a conversation with that child and let them know that they are important in your life personally and have a voice that they can um, be able to know that they can go to and that they can share their thoughts and concerns and um, I'm going to go through a little bit really quick here. What I want you to take away again from this is we did a brain break. That was that turn off the brain. I want you to also think there are focused attention breaks that are wonderful. And that would be more mindfulness types of activities. So we might sit and just just listen to the outside noise. Maybe there's a chime that is more playing for a moment. They listen and concentrate for sustained attention. And that's really what being uh, present, uh, the idea of meditation, of mindfulness, is trying to sustain your attention in the present moment. When you deep breathe, you're focusing on your breathing. If I gave everybody a small rock to hold and close their eyes and just feel the texture of the rock, if we all sucked on a raisin, not as much fun as a piece of candy, maybe a piece of good chocolate candy, but don't take a bite and just let it melt in your mouth of your sustained attention. In fact, if I'm eating chocolate, I don't want anybody to talk to me because I want to focus on that candy, those calories that I need. So think about that as, as the difference between a brain break, we were up, we were moving, we are increasing dopamine, and then this other calmness and this focused attention break. And they don't take very long to do. Again, there are tons of them. We'll share some on our website. Um, we have another resource that's in general called uh, Low Cost, No Cost Sensory Strategies for the Classroom that is published through Asperger's Autism Digest. Um, it is a free download. If you go onto the website, you can find that as well. We talked about dopamine release. And do I have a minute just to talk about anything 
legibility. Sure. Have your questions ready in your mind, and we'll do the <coughs> right things. I'm going to cut to a lot of chase because I know we're almost out of time. There's a whole ton of thing on handwriting and writing, and I think a lot of us are struggle with when to teach handwriting and when to go to technology. And I think that each child is very individual. And given all the challenges that we've shown you that our kids have with the writing process, I want to have them be as successful as possible and to love to write and celebrate every little moment. So I'm going to use tools that offer them things individually. I've had first graders I've introduced keyboarding to because they were so incredibly dyspraxic and had so much dysgraphia problems. And the schools moved very fast and they were able to get yeah, out the thought they got good ideas. They were smart kiddos. I've had other kids that I would go longer in trying to teach printing skills. There's lots of good strategies on printing, and if you're working with a good OT that she can share, and I can also share some additional ones if you contact me and email me. I want you to think about this. There's paper out there, there's pencil grips, there's ways to adapt things. We can reduce things, we can chunk it down, we can take turns. I'll write a sentence, you write a sentence. I'll type a sentence, you write a type of sentence. And you're going to not always do these things. We're going to fade. We're going to prompt them fade and grow independence and grow success and show our kids how much they truly can do on their own. Um, I wanted to show, just looking at the common accommodations and look a little bit at the keyboarding. There's a ton of programs out there for handwriting. Um, this program, or this example here, was just my kiddo by just taking those yellow high dead lines. You can see the difference in his printing skills. What a difference it made when he was writing with nothing. He was the kiddo who looked like one word, one giant long word for a whole paragraph. By just giving him yellow lines to put on, now we could read and it was less than what he was writing. It made a huge difference for him. Having the spacing tools, having uh, fingers, the space bars, the space man, uh, the little clever path. There's lots of things out there that you can use for spacing. Handwriting versus keyboarding, this, it supports both. But there's studies, these studies that say, hmm, there's merit to doing pencil paper. There's connections of why I remember my notes and my studying and my writing. But we're talking about kiddos and students who have extra challenges and the difference of what their brains are wired and the way things are working. And if they're struggling, they're not going to remember what those notes are. They can't read their own writing. So we need to offer individually different tools. So I, enjoy, I would encourage you to do keyboarding, at least by third grade. If I don't get kids who are having both hands on the keyboard, we get really bad habits of like, like they don't stabilize their paper when they print. They've got one hand resting in their lap while they're heading and packing. So both hands on the keyboard. By third grade, hand span is a nice developmental size to try to start pull row keys. You can do second grade, that's okay. But I meant that ideally, third grade size of the hands developmentally is a good size. Frequent exposure to keyboarding, because we are here to the kids going to junior high and high school. If they have not had keyboarding skills and we have that under accommodations, they are not going to be successful at I-step testing and doing the right we do. So whatever accommodations we're using, they have to be used every day, and we have to learn those skills. I think it's important that we teach kids to self-regulate and learn things that are themselves. I can't tell a kiddo to back away from a chair and take a break during I-step, but I can teach them every day that this is a strategy that you can do without asking anybody that you can stand and stretch, you can rub your hands on your legs. I, I can't tell him to get out his highlighter during I step five and teach him every day to use that highlighter for important text. Use that if you need that for lines while you're printing. Um, <coughs> I want to make sure I'm keyboarding. I'm trying to think of anything else I know about out of time. What is our time limit? Do we have time? Three minutes. I'd like to ask questions. Have questions. <laughs> you have some questions. You know, she's saying that he's a little OCD and that his brain is growing so fast he can't keep up if he's on the keyboard as well. Are there any suggestions? And the first thing that comes to my mind is that he could do speech to text to get out all of his thoughts and all of his ideas. And then he could take that if it's necessary and, and look at that while he's trying to, I wouldn't say start over again and use it from scratch. I take what I brainstorm and then start cleaning it up. Punctuation, make my paragraphs, whatever it is I need to do. But at least he's got a quick way to get out all his thoughts, reduce his frustration. And here's my working memory right here. Here's my brainstorming. And then I can adapt it and do what I need to do it better. There is a free download for teachers through, for Read and Write Gold. Has anybody used Read and Write Gold? It's a Google Chrome uh, program. But anyway, for teachers, you can get it for free. And it has a lot of tools, many tools. One of the tools is a text-to-speech. So he can get all of his thoughts down, and it has speech to text and text to speech. 
so he can get all of his thoughts down and then he can listen to them to see if they really say what he wants it to say. So that's kind of a good tool for some of the kids who have OCD type tendencies. We have Read and Write Gold in our district and we use it for all students, not special ed alone, all students. It has word prediction, vocabulary better, speech to text, text to speech. I encourage you to look into it. It's, it's really good for Google Chrome. Thank you guys so much. We have I Need to Write Facebook, I Need to Write, and a website. We try to get tips all the time. Thank you.